so the education is in Burmese, but you are a different ethnic group with a different ethnic language. So how does how do you think your skills are in that language now? What do you think of the fact that education is conducted in Burmese? Gotcha. Talk with a couple different people of different ages and experiences. Yeah. Because Myanmar has so many ethnic groups and so many languages. You're listening to Speaking of Language, a podcast recorded at the Language Resource Center at Cornell University. Each week, we explore a topic related to language pedagogy and second language acquisition. This week on Speaking of Language. Cornell undergraduate Nisa Burns shares her experiences learning multiple Southeast Asian languages and how study abroad has influenced her future aspirations for language revitalization. Welcome to a new episode of Speaking of Language. I'm Angelica Kramer, the director of the Language Resource Center at Cornell University. And I'm Sam Lupowitz, the LRC's media development manager. Today, Nisa Burns is in the studio with us. Nisa is a junior student in linguistics at Cornell. Nisa participated in a pilot course titled Gender and Global Change in Myanmar, and we will talk about her experiences learning languages and studying abroad. Welcome to Speaking of Language, Nisa. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Very timid, which is so funny because you are not timid at all. You're super bubbly and quirly, right? I try. Is quirly a word? I was just going to ask you if that was something. In that German, was... it is. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. What What does it mean in in German? Well, it when you means... when you when you mix batter, you you quillen. Okay. You mix batter. So I guess you're mixy. Is that an English word? All right. No, but I can see how it, it fits with bubbly. Anyway. Well, hello, Nisa. We are so <laughs> excited to have you on our podcast today. <laughs> Thank you. So before we start talking about the study abroad program that you went on, can you tell us a little bit more about your personal journey with languages? I know that you are learning multiple languages here at Cornell. What are those languages? What got you interested? And how come you chose linguistics as your major? Okay, so while growing up, I grew up in a heritage-speaking household. Mm -hmm. So my mom taught me Thai mm -hmm. since I was little. Okay. And, well, my dad is very American. So <laughs> by now he can he can understand some Thai if he wants to, Okay, which is good. <laughs> And but, if he doesn't want to, he can plead ignorance. Oh, yeah. He, he totally zones out if he doesn't want to hear it. But, yeah, so I grew up speaking English and Thai. And then I took, like, once a week Chinese school in fourth and fifth grade. But mm. I got bored and didn't go back. Because, mm. I mean, my mom's family is Thai Chinese. But most of the Chinese diaspora to Thailand is actually Thatchio, not Mandarin. Mm, okay. And my mom was the youngest child, so she never actually spoke that anyway. Oh, interesting. So I didn't have enough connection to Mandarin sure, to sure. really maintain my mm -hmm. interest. Mm -hmm. But I took Spanish from 6th through 12th grade. Okay. I'd like to say I can still speak that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure you can. With horrible <laughs> accent. But, um, yeah, so I, I'd say I'm pretty fluent in Spanish. Pretty fluent in informal to rude Thai because that's what I was raised on. <laughs> I can't, I can't do academic language, but I feel like most heritage students can't. Yeah, that's true. Yep. After I came to Cornell, I decided because, I mean, I already took Spanish. There's no real need to continue that because I can maintain <laughs> that on my own. Mm -hmm, so I decided mm -hmm. to pick up a totally new language and started Burmese. How did you select that? Well, uh, there's a lot of Burmese migrant workers in Thailand who have come to seek better job opportunities. Mm -hmm. But Thai people have historically not bothered to learn any of the languages of okay. the surrounding areas. Mm -hmm. So um, I figured by studying Burmese, it would be a rare um, opportunity to speak both. And also, it's just a rare opportunity to learn in general because yeah. only a handful of universities in the U.S. offer Burmese. Yep. Plus, I heard the teacher was nice. <laughs> she, is. she is. Indeed, yes, she is. <laughs> And then my sophomore year, spring, I had the uh, lucky opportunity to take a pseudo-heritage Thai class mm -hmm. because I could probably read like a preschooler who had just been exposed to the concept sure. of letters. Mm -hmm. But 
there were a couple other people interested in taking a heritage class. So she, um, Professor Ngampit mm-hmm. uh, Jagosinski, well, yeah, Atjan Ngampit, <laughs> which is a, like, I don't know, teacher, instructor. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, she whipped up this heritage class where we gained literacy, mm-hmm. and now I can read like a fourth grader. Excellent. Hey, that's an improvement, right? That's a big jump. <laughs> One semester. <laughs> that's amazing, actually. Yep. So then, but I only took that one semester because this semester I picked up Hungarian. Why Hungarian? That's what got me interested in linguistics. Oh, okay. okay. Which brings us okay. to yeah. the next question, <laughs> which is why linguistics? So <laughs> That is a really weird story. Uh, basically, uh, long story shortish, I watched a musical in Hungarian in ninth grade when I was supposed to be doing my homework. <laughs> And it was a uh, it was actually Romeo and Juliet because uh. I thought it would help me understand Romeo and Juliet in that we were had not yet read in class okay. better. So I chalked it up to totally not procrastinating. It's sure. for <laughs> class benefit. Yeah, that works. But then I got really really into this musical and oh. learning the lyrics and stuff. But learning the lyrics proved to be a little weird. So I ended up going down the Wikipedia rabbit hole of how does Mm. this language work? Wait, there's so much technical word, like Mm -hmm. vocabulary here. So what's this going on, like going on? And so I ended up interested in linguistics because it required a lot of linguistics to try to parse whatever Hungarian was because the language is structured so differently from English. Hmm. So... Um, yeah, because most things are suffixes in Hungarian, yep. Yep. where we would just have separate words for things. So as a result, I realized I could not self-study Hungarian because mm-hmm. I am really bad at self-studying, <laughs> but also that I was interested in linguistics. Mm-hmm. So I jumped on the chance to study it here, but yeah. it never worked out in my schedule until this year. That's excellent. I'm so glad that this did work out now. Do you think you'll add any other languages in your remaining time here at Cornell? <laughs> I wish. I wish. But um, probably not. I did do the one credit jumpstart um, Tagalog mm-hmm. my freshman mm-hmm. year. A couple weeks of the Indonesian one, but I had to drop it. But the Tagalog one was mostly culturally focused, but I did learn how to maintain the exchange of, hi, how are you? Oh, I'm mm-hmm. doing well. Mm-hmm. And things like that. So. Yeah. I, I appreciate being able to have a short, like, exchange in a bunch of different languages. Yeah. Okay. Um, can you tell us a little bit maybe about uh, the benefit of speaking another language and being culturally competent? What does that mean to you? How has that benefited you? Well, um, in regards to knowing, like, a couple words, I feel like it brightens people's days to mm-hmm. know that I am trying mm-hmm. yeah. yep. my best. Yeah, to... very true. <laughs> I've learned from... Living in, I live in the international dorm, Mm -hmm. Hilk, and I've learned from some of the Chinese international students how to say good luck and good night Mm -hmm. because I feel like they're very relevant um, phrases. So for for the languages I don't speak fluently, that's that's the case. But also for the languages I do speak pretty well, I feel like it just makes people happy to Mm -hmm. be able to speak in Mm -hmm. their language and also. And also, I guess, gossip. (laughs) (laughs) Or hear gossip. Yeah, yeah. Are there any other dimensions of the benefits beyond, you know, that social connection? You already talked about your personal heritage, right? I mean, that Mm -hmm. that seems to be important to you and personal interests. But if you think about if you had to convince some of your friends— why they should learn one of these maybe less commonly taught languages. What arguments would you give them? Why why should they consider something like that? The class size is tiny and really uh, personal. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's that's usually my selling point, especially how really small classes like Burmese, they sit you down at the beginning of the semester and say, so when are you free? Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. when class is, which I try to sell some of the, like, the STEM students with, like, very set schedules that a smaller language would fit better. Yeah. And then also, well, yeah, so the sort of the schedule element and the um, ability to not need office hours because class is one whole office hour. Mm. And especially for the ones who are not 
as strong at language learning, I figure it would allow the teacher to help you a lot more mm-hmm. when the teacher knows your name by the mm-hmm. first day of class. Sure. Yeah. yeah, that's great. All right. Well, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about your experience in Myanmar um, taking the Gender and Global Change course. That was really exciting because... I didn't hear about it until that semester because we just got the funding last fall. Mm -hmm. So I walked into work one day because I work for SEAT and I was told, oh, you're going to Myanmar. And I was like, okay, (laughs) nice, (laughs) sure. There were actually just two undergrads on the Mm -hmm. trip. And it was so it was a rare opportunity to be able to go to a country and also be able to maneuver however necessary because I know the Cambodia trip takes 12 or 20 students. So you Mm got to account for everyone. But with two people, you could arrange restaurant meetings Mm -hmm. or Mm -hmm. everyone sitting in the same boat. Yeah. (laughs) Like literally. Literally the same boat. (laughs) Four hour boat trip up a river and then three days, um, three days on a lake that the only travel is boat. Mm. So we could all fit in the same one. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. The trip was based around gender and global change and stuff, which is the um, was the focus of Evelyn, the other undergrad. Mm -hmm. She was in the middle of writing her senior thesis. Okay, I think she was studying government and history. Okay, and so her focus led to our group meeting a bunch of women's groups in Mm. Myanmar and establishing new connections with people. Okay. So that we could learn more about what's the women's rights situation, how are these women's groups fighting Mm -hmm. to make equality happen. Sure. And then I had to do a write-up too, even though I was mainly there just to practice my, at the time, year and a half of Burmese. Mm -hmm. But since I'm interested in minority languages and education, I got to meet with some faculty from the Yangon School of Education Hmm. and also I got to help out as a TA for an English class at MIT Mm. Uh which is the Myanmar Institute of Theology (laughs) with a lecturer who actually came here to teach I think the term is FLTA Mm-hmm. Yep. A she was an F- foreign language teaching assistant. Yep. Yep. She was an FLTA for Burmese a couple years back. Mm-hmm. And her computer screen is still a picture of Cornell. Oh. <laughs> so I got to help teach English that day. So nice. I just got getting to talk with some minority students mm-hmm. and just be like, so the education is in Burmese, but you are a different ethnic group with a different ethnic language. So how does how do you think your skills are in that language now? What do you think of the fact that education is conducted in Burmese? Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Talk with a couple different people of different ages and experiences. Yeah. Because Myanmar has so many ethnic groups and mm-hmm. so many languages. What would you say was the most impactful or transformative experience that you've had on that trip? Something that, you know, stuck with you? Oh, man. There were probably many instances of things that were just yeah, different or exciting. Well, the cost of things was different and very exciting mm-hmm. because <laughs> things cost a lot less there. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, food was very cheap and very tasty. Mm, nice. That's always a plus. Um, one thing that was a big surprise was when we went to... When we went to this one suburb or township that's, Mm -hmm. as Yangon has expanded, has sort of become part of the city and engulfed and Mm. whatnot. But they had a historical large population of the Karen minority, Mm -hmm. a very bloody history because they were, um, yeah, there was a lot of bloodshed there in the past century. So, uh, yeah, a lot of Karen people from what I learned in the Mm pre-readings that we needed to read before we went to Myanmar. Yeah. There was a scene, this township, insane, was the, there was a lot there. Mm -hmm. Karen New Year is actually a national holiday, Hmm. even though it's this one ethnic group. 
But that's where the Kren people who are around Yangon flock to for New Year's. Mm -hmm. It was January 6th this year. Okay. So we went to, and everyone was out in their their ethnic outfits Mm -hmm. looking really, really sharp Mm. because just uh, their outfits are usually like white with one or two accent colors. Uh So it's a very nice look. Yeah. Though all the all the different ethnic outfits in Myanmar are really cool, and I got really interested in trying to figure out what's what based on mm, like mm-hmm. the different patterns. Mm-hmm. But I, I always digress. <laughs> um, so while we were there, though, along one of the roads near an intersection, there were just a couple people sleeping on the ground hmm. in like a net on the ground. And not getting woken up by the cars just because of them being used to living there. Mm-hmm. And that was a that was a big surprise because mm-hmm. I'd be like, oh, my God, they're about to get hit. But that's yeah. that's where they that's sleep, where they yeah. sleep. That's where they live. Hmm. So that was a big that was a big surprise because mm-hmm. it was mm-hmm. dangerous, but also just daily life mm-hmm. for yeah. them. Yeah. Yep. Hmm. Wow. It sounds like this was quite an experience for you. So how do you think your experiences in Myanmar and all of your experiences with learning languages and your interest in linguistics, how will that shape your future? What do you think you want to do? And will language have a place in that? Language will definitely have a place in that. My (laughs) interest is um, language revitalization. Mm. As I found out, after freshman year, I went to a conference in Florida at mm-hmm. the University of Florida called Colang. And their their mission is to offer workshops for two weeks for both linguists and community language activists mm-hmm. to come together and learn things like the technology used for documenting languages, how to navigate indigenous rights yeah. with stuff like that. And learning more about the like the indigenous experience and just a bunch of networking for community language activists. Mm-hmm. So when I got there, I was like, oh, wow, this is actually a thing that I could help out with. This yeah. is a thing I could do because yeah. I never really thought that that was something. It was like, oh, language vitalization, that's a cool concept. Mm-hmm. That would be really cool, like hypothetically. Mm-hmm. But then I went there and it was like, oh, no, it's a reality. You can do this. So I've decided that I there's less than zero money there, but <laughs> I feel like I feel like it would be really nice mm-hmm. and fulfilling to help out my friends because oh, of course yeah. the number one rule is to assist not to be like I mm-hmm. know better than you all. Sure. No, nope, no. Nope. So I would love to help out yeah. in that capacity. Well, and also very important. Yeah. That's wonderful. Well, we are excited to see where this path takes you and all the wonderful things that you will be doing. But before we sign off, we'd like to ask you to share your favorite word in a language you speak or have learned, are learning, want to learn, and go. So my favorite word in Burmese that I learned over the summer in an intensive Burmese program at University of Wisconsin, Siasi, Mm -hmm. I learned the word for giraffe, Mm -hmm. which is tikalu. Wow. Which is really fun to say. Yeah, that's Say that again. Wow. <laughs> it's very rhythmic. I uh-huh. like that. Exactly. That one's really fun to say. I like it. Well, there we have it. Wonderful. Well, Nisa, thank you so much for being on our podcast today. And thanks for all the wonderful work that you do. Thank you. Next week, we will speak with Alyssa Ford, a student at Cornell's Samuel Curtis Johnson Graduate School of Management. We will chat with Alyssa about her past role as a linguist for the United States Navy, including the time she spent in their intensive language school, as well as working with civilian language analysts in the NSA. Until then, auf Wiederhören! The Language Resource Center is located on the ground floor of Stimson Hall on Cornell's main campus in Ithaca, New York. Check us out on the web at lrc.cornell.edu or look for Cornell LRC on Facebook and Twitter. Speaking of Language is produced by Angelica Kramer and Sam Lupowitz. Recorded by Sam Lupowitz. Original music by Sam Lupowitz, Dan Gable, and Joe Gibson. Thanks also to the College of Arts and Sciences at Cornell University. 
As a reminder, the ideas and opinions expressed on this podcast do not reflect those of the College of Arts and Sciences or any other official entity of Cornell University. We thank our listeners, and do stay tuned for our next episode.